Ah, good morning, good morning, good morning. I'm Kathy Ann Lewis. I am the spiritual director at the Center for Spiritual Living, and my pronouns are she and her, and my animals call me mom. <laughs> and some people call me K-A-L because Kathy Ann Lewis just goes on forever and ever. Too many syllables. So, my dears, today is an auspicious, auspicious, auspicious day. For so many reasons, and I know you think you know what the reason is, but actually it's the fall equinox. Yeah, 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 yeah. Personally, I don't pay too much attention to spring and fall equinoxes, don't care that much. I do pay a lot of attention to the winter solstice. You want to know why? Because after that day, we get three minutes of daylight per day. Oh, I mean, that's... Can you imagine? That's why there was a big celebration in the winter. That's why Jesus' birth had to happen in the winter. Because the Christians couldn't keep the pagans from celebrating. <laughs> so they just incorporated it. <sighs> anyway, that's the truth. That, that, that is actually the truth. And today is going to be a very pagan day because it is the fall equinox. So we're going into some pagan teachings. Yeah. <laughs> Ernest Holmes said we were open at the top, we're open at the bottom too. So, meaning what came before, what came before, what rises up in us. Because um, it's good, uh, you know, any good stuff is good stuff. <sighs> what I do know is that people all over the world have consciously observed where the sun was at certain times of the year. That's I, every country I've ever went to. I went to... I, um, uh, India, and there was some prince did all these astronomical um, mechanics, mechanisms so he could trace the sun and what time to do certain things. I mean, um, Egypt, in Egypt, um, many of the Holy of Holies were situated so that the sun would come in at a certain time, usually in the winter solstice. I mean, come on. Let's talk. Stonehenge, yeah. Newgrange. When we were in Ireland, we went to Newgrange. Now, see that beautiful work of art? Work of art, 5,000 years old. Yeah, supposedly built by Neolithic people. Except the, the math and the geometry and the ability to know where the sun was going to be on the winter solstice was pretty amazing for hunter-gatherer type people. For instance, here's the next slide. This is the sun coming in to the inner chamber. It only reaches the inner chamber one day a year. As the sun rose, on the winter solstice. Now, I have to admit, <laughs> Ireland is a lot like Seattle. The chance of there being sunlight on the winter solstice <laughs> and not having a bunch of clouds, you know, but still, just in case, they had an opening for it. Amazing, amazing, amazing. God, I love this stuff. So, pretty, pretty advanced technology, really, for Neolithic people, which makes me wonder why we think we're so superior that others didn't have access to wisdom, no matter what age or year it was done in. I think it's good to be humble. So, while we were in Ireland, we dabbled in some, another tradition. And, there, and I say dabble because there wasn't a lot of time to spend a lot of time on it because we spent a lot of time looking at things. But we did look at something that is also universal, and that is the four directions. We looked at the meaning and the blessing and the <sighs> gifts of the four directions. Because what they believed, and I, I know there's four directions that are celebrated in all the Americas, by indigenous people. In Ireland, it's a little bit different. It comes from a Celtic tradition, and it is to make the village whole 
and also to be incorporated by the people to make them whole. So the outer, outer tradition is, if you have this going on in a village, it will be a wholesome village. If you have it going on within yourself, you will experience wholeness. And wholeness is such, do you know the word shalom, peace, really meant wholeness? To wish you wholeness. To say shalom to someone means to, that you are wishing them well-being and a fullness of life. Who doesn't want more fullness of life? I mean, no matter how good life is, couldn't it be more whole? Couldn't it be more fulfilling? Couldn't you? I mean, this is what the four directions, according to Celtic tradition, offer all of us. It, it, it offers us wholeness so that we know there's nothing missing within us and there's nothing wrong within us. The gift is nothing missing, nothing wrong. And when we can know that for ourselves, we can know that about society and we can know that for others. We can only know for others what we know for ourselves. Have you noticed that some people blame people for the things they're doing themselves? Have you noticed that about you? I just wondered. So, you finally got it. Okay, great. What? Oh. Oh, you raised your hand. Well, I've noticed it not just in society, but just in, in people. So, we're going to start with the East. A lot of traditions start with the East, where things are born. But you're going to hear things like you've never heard them before, unless you went to a workshop that I did about 10 years ago. So, we start with the east because that's where the sun rises. That's where you first meet the sun. And in the east, according to Celtic tradition, the energy from the east is about abundance and prosperity. Well, now that's not a, that doesn't didn't come from my Native American traditions, but it's abundance and prosperity. What must rise within us to be whole is a sense of abundance and prosperity. It's also the sense of being a householder. It's the ability to create home and hospita hospitality in the community. Those were the merchants. Those were the ones that would trade. In a, in a village, if it's really going to do well, you know, you, you can only grow so many vegetables. Wouldn't it be nice to trade your vegetables for, for perhaps a lamb over there? And the people with the lambs, wouldn't they be more prosperous if they could trade their lambs for some, for some vegetables that they're not growing? It's about, it's about interchange. It's about interchanging of, of, of um, energy and goods. It was needed to do well. Oh, I had no idea I'd say this, but let's go back to Peru. So when we're in Peru, every time I've gone to Peru, I've worked with a shaman named Benito. Benito, oh my goodness, Benito. Benito is the shaman at a village that is at 16,000 feet above sea level. The only thing they can produce are potatoes. So for their village to work, Benito has to take the potatoes down into lower climates and trade for things. Then he also buys things so the women can do needlework and, and, and bead work. And it's the exchange. That's what prosperity is. It's the free flow of what you have to benefit others so that others can give the free flow to you for you can do better as well. Do you see why well, that was very vital to a Celtic organization? And that's what we need to take in for ourselves. This idea that what I need is mine if I'm willing to share what I have. It wasn't about hoarding. I'm keeping my potatoes. You keep your sheep, I'll keep my potatoes. It was about sharing, flowing, moving. It was about the wholesome activity that comes out of 
uh, abundance instead of scarcity. Because when we get scarce, we hold. We cling. And that's not prosperity. That's not wholeness. So what they tried to know is at one level is that's what was, that, it, that, that activity was necessary for a community be, to be healthy. And for an individual, we needed to know that what we needed would come to us from the universe. And then what we gave out was a generous contribution to who, those around us. So we practiced this when we were in Ireland. We would breathe in, abundance. We would breathe out, generosity. Breathe in, abundance. I have plenty of potatoes. We breathe out, I'll share them with you. I breathe in, abundance. I know you'll share with me. Do you see how that is a flow and a way of thinking that would make the community and the individual healthy? But all work and no play makes a village not so wonderful to be in. So then we look at the direction of the South. In the South, the energy is of the great song, the universe, the one song. They actually believe that the universe, one song. I mean, my goodness, they were pre-religious scientists. And that one song showed up in the individual and the community as inspiration and passion. It was the place that fed the, the bards, the storytellers, the artisans, the lovers of nature, the musicians, the poets. In our, you know, what's so beautiful is that we have a bunch of art downstairs from, from artists, not only in our, in our center, but in the whole neighborhood. We have a music department that's being fed by the inspiration of God to create a song that lifts us up. It, uh, this is associated with connecting to the rhythms of nature so that the rhythms of nature can have an outlet. Now, some people, I will just say this. For the practice for us when we were in Ireland, we would breathe in inspiration and we would breathe out creativity. Let's try that. Inspiration. Inspire. Inspiration. Creativity. Now, there's a whole lot of people that have a whole lot of baggage around creativity. Like, I'm not creative. How many of you have said that to yourself? How many? Come on. I want to see some lands. Come on. Well, you're healed. <laughs> Because it's a bunch of bunk. What, didn't we just sing about this? I am as God created me. God did not create us without talent. I am as God created me. No talent, no hope, no creation. I mean, we are creative because we are a chip off the old block. And the old block is creative. In the, God, in the beginning, God created. We're part of that. We're always creating. You're either creating stress or a mess, or you're creating something that's beautiful, cooperative, and harmonious. But we're always creating. See, for us to believe we're not creating, we not, in, on, not only dummy down our own intelligence, we dummy down the opportunity for God to express through us. Because we are creative. I mean, no, and don't take that as a bad thing. But if you're in a mess, who created it? If you're in trouble, who created it? If you don't like our country, who created it? See, it's the people that don't understand that they are creative that let other people that think they are creative create the country we're in. So if you don't like it, not only vote, yes, but I but spend every morning in your meditations and your visualizations creating the world and the country you want to live in. That's what you do. It's like, I hope it turns out okay. I 
will pray. If it doesn't turn out okay, at least I knew I did my part. Every morning you see it as you want it to be. I'm seeing love and cooperation and goodness rise up because some people have gone to sleep and they're still as God created them. And I want that God spark to spark. And I want the spark to spread. Hallelujah. Anyway. <laughs> That's inspiration. Because, because here's the other word that came to me. Because guess what? I was inspired to say it when we were on this trip. Is it's not just creativity. It's also solution. Breathe in inspiration. Breathe out solution. Breathe in inspiration. Breathe out solution. Because a solution is always a creative turn that will heal or fix an issue. If you have an issue, what you want is a solution. You don't want to just have it go away because guess what? There's learning in it for you. And you grow based on the big solution that comes through you. I mean, how many of you would just like to have something just go away? There's no growth in go away. There's growth in solution. Because if you have it go away, guess what? It just gets bigger and comes back. Hello, I'm here again. <sighs> now we're at this, the West. There's that beautiful song. What is it, um, JB? Um, this is the, what is it? That song that you guys sing? Oh, What's the name? May I suggest, and then there's the, 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 the message from the West, and that's the people that are going away and all that kind of stuff. Guess what? Not, not for the Celtics. For the Celtics, the West was the energy of knowledge. But the energy of knowledge came from a desire to know. Sometimes we don't want to know because we might be the one that's wrong. I mean, wanting to know takes an amazing amount of humility. It's the inner knowledge of the ancients. It was known as gnosis, or in, in the biblical terms, gnosis, and also it was medicine. It was, the, it was the energy of medicine for more American traditions, or the Americas, I should say. You know, not just America, the United States, but the Americas, the indigenous people, would call it the medicine. It's that which healed. It's that which perfected. It's that which made things better. And we hope open to that higher knowledge by longing for it. In the Lakota tradition, they would cry. They would cry out for a vision so they would know, know what to do. But it was a knowing it was a deep knowing. It, was the, it is the, the place of the medicine man in the Western culture and the druid in Ireland. Those people who had the wisdom that was handed down from generation to generation to generation. Now, there are different kinds of knowledge. There's, there's that which you can study and figure out, and there's that which comes from the heart and the spirit. And when you have things come from the heart and the spirit, it's better knowledge than when you figure it out. Because how many of you have figured out stuff and wish you hadn't figured that out? <laughs> if you connect with the life within you, then you have access to all the mysteries of the universe when you connect. So what we would do in Ireland is we would breathe in vision and we would breathe out counsel because the counseling came, the medicine man worked from, the shaman worked from knowledge that was old and ancient and universal. 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 Which is truth. In our community, those people are not called druids. <laughs> Although maybe we should just change it. Why not? 
How many of you have had trouble explaining what a practitioner is? So we'll just call them druids. Anyway, <laughs> we have a group of druids and medicine people, shaman, that work with truth. They have worked to know and they've longed to know truth. And let me explain what truth is. Truth is anything that sets an individual free. Now here's the weird part. Everybody has their own truth. That makes it complex. So what the druids, the practitioners need to do and know is such a universal truth, such a high truth, that it draws the individual truth out. Because I, I, I've seen it every single time, and Ernest Holmes even said this, there's no true healing without a personal revelation. You can't hear somebody else and go, oh yeah, that'll heal me. No, it doesn't. It just makes you kind of happy. But if you hear something and it sparks something within you, and it's a personal experience of that, that's, that will heal you. For instance, for me to know that it was okay to be shy. That was a personal truth that was like changed me. Because before I was shy, but I didn't think I was supposed to be shy, so I just made myself wrong all this time for being shy. Now I just know I'm shy. Sometimes I'm just shy, and I know the reason that I'm shy is so that I can make sure to have time to myself, otherwise I get sick. Because I use up too much chi. It changed everything. I haven't been sick since 1994. I mean, really sick. Because I had my truth. So, to, to honor and celebrate our wonderful druid, shaman, medicine people, practitioners, here's, <laughs> here's Jerry. <laughs> Yeah, it is an honor to honor practitioners, and I'm honored to be one. A uh, minister never stops being a practitioner, right? Ah, oh, I like that druid. Maybe we should get the little... <laughs> so we celebrate milestones of service. We get little pins we get to wear, and we can do whatever we want with these stoles. TC's got a whole little collection of pins over there. I love it every time I see that. So we have people that have served for five years and 10 years this year. And so we're going to honor them this morning. So I'd like to invite them up and give them their new pen, T.C. Cook. Vicki Draper. Sherry Grasso. Jim Landis, or somebody called him Swami today, so maybe that's his new term. And Sylvia Rose. Oh. Darn it. Share that one for now. I swear I counted right. And for 10 years, Francie Pease and Suzanne West. What a commitment. We had an amazing retreat yesterday, and I got the privilege of witnessing and feeling my own recommitment to God and this community, and that's what I witnessed yesterday. I'd also like to invite up Taffy Wallace. She's one of our new members of the body, as we call it, and we wanted to make sure that y'all knew what she looked like. She's, she's going to have a milestone next year. And any practitioner in the room, would you please stand? Yay. And may I have the slide, please? Our beloved Gary. Jim, would you just step a little to the side? Our beloved Gary, my classmate, served 14 and a half years. We miss him greatly. He was with us yesterday. He's always with us. And so for every practitioner, I offer you this blessing. May you recognize in your life the presence, power, and light 
of your soul. May you realize that you are never alone, that your soul and its brightness and belonging connects you intimately with the rhythm of the universe. May you have respect for your individuality and difference. May you realize that the shape of your soul is unique, that you have a special destiny here, that, that behind the facade of your life there is something beautiful and eternal happening. May you learn to see yourself with the same delight, pride, and expectation with which God sees you in every moment. Thank you so much for your service to this community and for your love of God demonstrated by that. Thank you. So a good community is being built. We have our merchants, the bookstore down below. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we have our musicians, our artists, our problem solvers. And then we go to the energy of the north. And when I was in Ireland, I said, so what do you think is missing? And they had all sorts of glorious, wonderful, you know, etherical ideas, you know, angels and, oh, you know, like sweet people. And it's like, not so much. In the village, in a Celtic village, they had the merchants, they had the artisans, they had the wise medicine workers, and they had the warriors. And now, I, yet, now I love it. <laughs> Through a spiritual body. <laughs> I don't know. <sighs> See, the energy of the north is the energy of battle and warriorship. It's the magic of conflict and rough places. Take a deep breath. <sighs> and the idea behind that is that victory over oneself is the primary goal of our lives. Are you willing to take a stand for who you truly are? Or are you willing to be buffeted and bumped around by other people's opinions of you and your stinking thinking? Thank you, Eddie, for that, that little term, stinking thinking. This is the direction of challenge, testing, and discipline. See, it's good to make music and, you know, and have, you know, sacred healings, but there's no conflict. If there's no conflict, there's no growth. If there's no challenge, there's no growth. But we can either, I love it. This is why Jesus said, be as a little child. The baby falls down, gets on all fours, but wants to walk. By the way, it doesn't want to walk because people want it to walk. It wants to walk because life wants to walk. Life wants to become. You are as God created you, which is to overcome. And only a human being can say, no, I just don't want to. It's just too much effort. <laughs> and we do. You know people that do. I have a family that does that. God bless them. And they wonder why I've accomplished so much. Because I saw it as a challenge. They saw it as an obstacle. Think about this. You know, one of the things I want is for spiritual people, people who know that they are an expression of the divine and that everyone else is, no matter what their color is, no matter who they love, if they knew that the everyone is an expression of God and they took a stand for it, our country would be different. But so many people are like, let's just be love and light. <laughs> well, be a big light. You know, you can have a little tiny candlelight or you can have a bonfire. <sighs> so we inhaled courage and we exhaled self-mastery. Want to do it? Inhale courage. <sighs> Exhale self-mastery. <sighs> Inhale courage. <sighs> Exhale self-mastery. 
See, our biggest enemies, our biggest enemies, are those people we're out of sync with. They believe different, they vibrate differently. But guess what? They can draw a circle to keep us out, but love and us have the wit to win. We draw a circle and take them in. But we have to take a stand for that. You know? <sighs> when we embrace the energy of the North, we take everything that comes up and challenges us as an opportunity to grow in who we really are, which is, I am as God created me in the light and the love and the glory. So let's do it again. I am as God created me in the light, in the love, in the glory. This is what we are. I am as God created me Ooh. in the light, in the love, in the glory. Keep singing. when I feel small, even when people say I'm not good enough, even when people call me names, even when people challenge my beliefs, even when people say, well, who are you to think that way? Who are you to stand up for that? Then this goes off in our head. I am. And so it is.